I am Jimbo Paris, and you are listening to the Jimbo Paris Show. All right, how's it going, everyone? I am Jimbo Paris. Welcome again to the Jimbo Paris Show. And today we have an excellent guest, podcast host of the digital show, as well as tech entrepreneur and digital strategist, Chris Hood. Hello. Wow. You have an amazing setup back there. I love it. Ah, uh, yeah. I love it too. I spent a lot of time. I actually just bought this house a little while ago. And the first thing I said was, I'm going to build a studio in the house and set it all up. So... I can do all of my podcasting from here. So what is it that you um, specifically do? Oh, well, I do a lot of things. But if we're talking specifically on my full-time day-to-day job, it's talking with a lot of different businesses about innovation and strategy, digital strategies, and how they can be successful in this world of digital. And so, yeah, I work for Google as the head of business innovation and strategy and that's where I spend a lot of time. But in my spare time, I also teach at a couple of different universities in technology, and I write, and I podcast. So I do a little bit of a lot of things. Wow. Okay. Okay. And which industry have you sort of been in the longest? You've personally felt you've put the most um, of your energy into. I've spent a lot of time in the media and entertainment space. So that's mm. across film and television, music, video games. But today I spend a lot of time across multiple industries. We often talk to retail companies or healthcare. And what we find is that the challenges that a lot of companies are faced with, despite whatever industry they're in, is usually the same. It's how do I generate more money for my organization and how do I get more customers to be interested in me? And those basic principles, I think, can be associated across all industries and leveraging different technologies. We're all consumers. And so we expect things in certain ways. And that's what we talk about is is how can we meet those customers and consumer expectations with technology? When it comes to the entertainment and media industry, what was the history of your career? Where did it all start? Well, all the way back to my first job, which was at a movie theater. And I was sweeping up popcorn in a movies and selling popcorn and taking tickets at the front door. And I really just fell in love with it. And Mm -hmm. after I started working at that theater, I received additional opportunities in the television and film space. I went to school and started studying radio and television production. Uh, I worked at the theater for about almost 10 years. And then during that time, had several opportunities in different types of businesses to uh, expand across. And as my career progressed, I had some really exciting chances to work in these different spaces. And it just stuck. It, It was not only a passion of mine and career, but the opportunities, uh, opened up and it was great to be able to do things that I actually loved to do. What fascinated you so much about theater? Because I'm thinking now in the cinema, sweeping up popcorn, doing this stuff, but you guys also get a lot of benefits too. You know, you get to kind of watch free movies and all those other great things. Yeah. Well, that was what I first decided. I was sitting with my friend at the time and we were in a uh, fast food restaurant eating lunch or something and we were gonna go to the movies that night and i remember at the time the tickets for that movie were four dollars and 25 cents time i was like man this is a lot of money for us to be going to the movies all the time if i got a job at the movie theater hey we could save all this money and we'd be able to go in and see movies for free and so that's what i did so i got the job and first thing i did was like the next week my buddy and i went in sort of before you were doing it and all these other things you were kind of doing radio production tv work yeah well i was doing radio in my college so i was on the college radio station and doing some of that work i I had an internship for anybody in the west coast i had an internship for a little while on KISS FM with Rick D's in the morning. And so that was fun. That also is partly what 
gravitated me today towards podcasting because I can get into this deep voice. I loved talking in that kind of capacity. So I was doing that at a very early age, but the technology piece has followed me along my entire career as well. Actually, I was using computers even before I started working. Um, when I was 16, 15, 16 years old, I had my first computer. And technology to me at that time was nothing more than a hobby. There were no really big jobs in tech, you know, in, unless you were working at like NASA or the FBI or big giant mainframe computers. And so to me, it was simply like, become uh, successful in the movies because computers was just a hobby is something I did in my spare time over the course of the, the 90s into the 2000s as the internet blossomed. We became more aware that technology was going to become the mechanism for things like entertainment. If we fast forward, we obviously see things like Netflix today and Spotify and ways of consuming music in video games and and movies. But that entire transition over the course of the last 40 years, I've been a part of and I've followed and I've been beneficial, lucky really, because I've had that technology background along with the passion for media and entertainment. So speaking of, you know, your transition, the University of Phoenix, you made a transition to information technology. Can you kind of go more into what that is and that kind of accolade that you have? Yeah, well, as I was saying, I've been in technology and in the media space for quite some time. And as I was thinking that technology was really nothing more than a hobby, and I was going to focus my entire career on making movies or writing video games or something, I began to see that technology was rapidly becoming more of a way of life. And so I said, hey, I'm going to basically go back to school. I'm going to focus on a technology degree. I'm going to get a, a job that's focused in technology. It was really this point in time where I said, okay, let's stop working at the movie theater and let's start working in technology. I was able to leverage my experience in media and entertainment, the passion that I had, the working at the movie theaters, radio, television, all these things that I had done. And now I could apply those into the technology that I was getting my degree in and, and starting to focus more attention to. And it was that kind of transition, especially at the time when the internet became a reality, that we started to see businesses leveraging technology. And I said, I get that. I understand that. This is what I've been doing. And now I can apply it because I have the balance of both of those skill sets. And it's quite ironic because nowadays everything is about leveraging technology to consumers. So you really did strike a gold mine there. Additionally, you know, you worked for a little bit in a music industry as well. So I, I kind of heard the radio voice you had there. And how, how did you sort of get into that music industry component though? Well, at the time I was working in different capacities across the media and entertainment, and I had this technology background and an opportunity was presented to me to work at a startup that was specifically designed to curb music piracy issues on college campus. And what it really became was the first insights into what the cloud is today and how we share music and how we access music today digitally. And this service was the first of its kind. It was all about how do I access great playlists, you know, share music that I'm passionate about with other people. So yeah, I, I took the risk. I went and went to the startup. The startup was called Ruckus at the time. And then it got acquired and uh, was very successful. And it was the foundation for all of the various music services we see today. When you sort of began to discover who you were and you sort of started to really get involved in this, how did you sort of feel? I don't know if I necessarily felt one way or the other. I mean, I think at the time, it's just about making decisions. I think these are things we all go through. If you were presented with a new job tomorrow, today, you would reflect on it. You know, and, and there's various reasons why we all transition between different jobs and, and take different career paths, make different decisions. That's not just professionally. This is real life, too. And oftentimes, we don't see it 
in the moment when we're there. Well, I was just using the information in front of me and trying to make a decision. All the way back to like the movie theater. I was going to go to the movies that night. It was $4.25 for a ticket. And I was like, this is too expensive. I should get a job at the movie theater so I can get in to see movies for free. That was what the decision was at the time. If I look back now at making that decision to work at the movie theater, absolutely, I would do it a hundred times. But there's definitely been roles that I've taken and in, in opportunities and events in my life that I've reflected on and said, hmm, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Or maybe I should have did it a different way. That's life. And I think for me in this transition between media and entertainment, I never looked at it as like, I'm going to like, I'm a doctor and now I've decided that I want to go be a lifeguard. I've actually looked at it as a way that I can leverage these experiences and bring them all together to talk with people today about a broad range of different things. I'll give you another real quick example. I had somebody once say, my son is in fashion design and wants to get into technology. What would you, you know, suggest? My suggestion is go into technology. If that's what you want to do, you can apply everything you've learned in fashion design into technology. There's a lot of opportunities out there. Yes. We're starting to see things like virtual try-ons of outfits on uh, main websites. We're seeing outfits of different types being created inside of uh, video games. Heck, the whole metaverse and the concepts of what the metaverse are going to become is this uh, personification of ourselves inside of a virtual reality that is going to be equipped with things we wear. So you can't ever say that just because you have experience in one thing that you can't apply it to something else. Those are your experiences and you can bring that to the table. And that's the key is how do you manage all of the different things you've learned throughout your life? and apply that into a way that you can leverage in something you want to do in the future. That's a different way of thinking about it. Because, you know, a lot of times when people have goals in life, they focus necessarily on more so pursuing those goals, but not really using the tools that they've harbored to kind of go into that industry. You really, really um, are hitting at some points here that even I, you know, don't even know. So... Again, these are these are some big gems here you're throwing out. Speaking of that, you know, you already gave an amazing piece of advice. Sir. If, if you were to kind of mentor someone or give someone advice on how to do what they need to do, would that be the first thing you say to them to sort of leverage their skills to work in what they need to do? If you have a goal, there could be any number of different types of goals. For example, I want to write a book. That might be a goal for you. Or I want to start a podcast or I want to get into a new career. Well, in all those situations, even podcasting, you should start with, what do you know? Create a podcast about something you're passionate about and something you know. Let's use something like even uh, a job. What's the first thing we do when we want to apply to a job? We create a resume. What's the resume? The resume is the last several things that I've done. And so many people focus on, well, uh, my resume doesn't have the things in it that align to what I want to do, as opposed to trying to look at all of the things you've done and how those things you've done apply to what you want to do. The resume is never just a bunch of stuff on a piece of paper to convince somebody that you're the right candidate. It's a story of your life. And that story can paint a picture of how and what experience you can bring to that company. And sometimes it's as simple as, well, I've got great communication skills because I have a podcast hmm. or hey, I've got fashion design experience, so I would love to apply those in the metaverse. That's what you have to look at, is how do you leverage all of the things that you have done to do what you want to do? And not as a, oh, here's something new I want to do and, uh, and just ignore your entire history. Like That doesn't make sense. You were also in the video game industry as well. So what was sort of your experience in that area? Well, I've been in video games for a while. Same thing. Video games were always a passion of mine. And I've been in a lot of different organizations throughout the video game space. Uh, I was presented with an opportunity again, new opportunity to uh, start a video game company. And I went with that. And same thing, same concept, same principles. It was a passion of mine. It was a, a new opportunity. I took the chance and I ran with it. So speaking of, you know, these passions and sort of these things you go with and all these things you build, 
How did you sort of harbor that innovation mindset? Well, the innovation mindset really starts back with the customer. And similar to like you leveraging your experiences, we have to take a different view of this. And oftentimes we think about innovation as some big lightning in the bottle creative idea. And really all innovation is, is around solving problems. So if we look back as an example in the music industry, when I took on this opportunity, the challenge at that time was I want to be able to create a playlist on my device, but I don't want to have to recreate that same playlist on a computer. So how do I create a playlist in one place and share the music across multiple systems? That was the problem. So then you solve it with technology. And if you think of everything, like a light bulb is nothing more than it's dark in this room and candles are running out. How do I create something else so I can see at night? Every single innovative idea really is solving a problem. And the people who can see problems are usually the people who can innovate faster. And I think that's it. It's just understanding what problems are and then being able to understand how to solve those problems. Now, speaking of solving problems, you were head of business platform strategy at Google, I believe. Yep. What, what did you sort of do in that role of yours? I bring everything together now at Google. All of my experience in media and entertainment, all of my experience with innovation, like we're talking about, uh, this customer first perspective, building cultures, all of that comes to basically a head at Google. I apply everything I've learned over my career and help organizations and businesses see this. So it's been great because I can take the principles and, and the lessons learned and the experience of my career and apply it to, into uh, you know, uh, other organizations. What were some of the biggest problems you dealt with when you were working in Google? These are usually more aspirational types of problems. Hey, we want to have flying cars. Okay, well, let's think about how we might be able to solve that type of problem, right? Or, hey, I would really love if you can predict for me, you know, what stocks to buy, you know, leveraging something like artificial intelligence. Or if I'm doing a Google search and I'm looking for uh, a specific movie with a specific actor or something, I want Google to basically know what I'm thinking about before I put it in the system because I don't remember what the actor's name is, right? You know, these types of problems that we see from a consumer perspective on a regular day basis, that's more what we're looking at, right? Like, how do we make experiences for consumers more interesting and compelling and help them get to the data or information or thing that they want to get to faster? So when it comes to sort of marketing, what are some of the best digital marketing strategies that you see that might currently work? Marketing in general is, is really just about the same thing as is, is getting the right message out and meeting the customers in, 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 in the ways that they want to be met. And for some, that's on social media. For some, it's on a podcast, you know, YouTube and, and video format. We all want to engage with brands that we align to and that we're interested in. And then it's really just about building that relationship. Really, that's what marketing is. Build the relationship and bring people together in the platforms or the you know, services that they want to uh, connect with you on. And how did you evolve this strategy over time? Was there any form of progression as you first started your digital marketing journey to now that I'm sort of working with you and speaking with you and giving you this stage? I think it's just about trial and error and experience. And over the years, you know, you try different things, you see what works, and then you apply that in, into uh, new marketing mechanisms. So what is sort of the, you know, the future of digital media in sort of these coming years? I, I think the basic principles still apply, which is we have consumers, you and I are a consumer. Uh, we want to engage with products and services and brands that we like. And those brands need to uh, find ways to connect with us. And, and that technology, that connection piece is going to change. And you just have to be able to keep up and know that. And, and that's the challenge, right? It's because all of a sudden tomorrow there's some new widget and you're going to have to be able to... Uh, you know, leverage it. I don't know. So I'm going to be real with you. That actually shocked me quite a bit because I was thinking here that you would sort of have a bit more of a direct answer on that. But yeah, the reality is, is no one knows. 
we talk about like the metaverse and you'll have a lot of people saying, oh, the metaverse is going to be the next big thing. They don't know that. No one knows that. Hmm. If we did, we'd be rich. The challenge is not knowing what's going to be next. Being able to be agile or nimble enough that whatever is next, you can adapt. And so we can predict a lot of things. I can predict that one day there will be flying cars. It's a prediction. And if that happens, then I can say, see, I was right. You know, I, I can predict that one day uh, we'll have eyeglasses that uh, will show us Netflix. Sure, maybe. Sure, I can sit here and predict a lot of things. That's what science fiction is all about, is the prediction of different types of technologies. Whether or not they're going to come true, or at what point in time they do, or how fast they will, or if they will even happen, or if some other type of technology will leapfrog over this, we don't know. We have to be agile and, and be able to adapt as they do change. Who are your major career influences? You know, I, I've got a lot of coworkers and people that I work with that, you know, I, I'm very close to and I respect and they have uh, incredible opinions. There's obviously other people in different industries, you know, that I like to hear what they have to say. I just like surrounding myself with people, you know, and, and learning from them. You know, it's, it's about meeting new people. It's not about maintaining close circles of specific individuals. I, I think the more people that you meet in your life, the more perspective that you can get, the more experiences that you can learn from that will help you find these problems, solve these problems, and try new things. I've always been about just meeting more people and expanding that, and uh, you just never know what you're going to learn. So when it comes to people that you work with, have you ever taught people? Have you ever mentored people? Have has anyone ever asked for your guidance? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, all the time. I'm happy to talk with people and I'm happy to support people, you know, with whatever they need. So when it comes to digital media, do you have any advice that you would give to anyone revolving around that? Just research. Talk to people, learn, research, read, listen, and uh, learn. I, I mean, really, that's what it boils down to is just get different opinions and perspectives. When we're looking at sort of startups, what do you think are kind of the biggest, most notable trends that you've noticed? All startups today are mostly focused on some form of technology or have to leverage technology. And even if you say that you're, you know, a nonprofit or some type of small little entity, you're going to have to use technology because we're surrounded by technology. Consumers want that technology. And so technology has to be a part of your plan in some way. Now, we talked a lot about your career, but are there any sort of hobbies that you like doing outside of everything else? Like, what does Mr. Hood do outside of all this work? My hobbies are the same as my career. It's mostly mm -hmm. media and entertainment. So I can get on the couch and watch some Netflix or something or play a video game. Like, what I talk about is what I'm passionate about. Those are my hobbies. You know... When people are sort of pursuing your goal or maybe taking, and as you said, taking their skills to transition to a new area that they're interested in, what are some common pitfalls they may go through? I think the biggest challenge is that people have a belief that they want to stick with or a, a thought process. I know what we need. I know what the technology is that we're going to build, or I know what the solution, just like we can't predict what the future is. And just like, I don't know what the next big thing is. You can't necessarily say, you know, what you need to build or what you, what the technology needs to be, or what the solution is or anything without some sort of data to back it up, whether that's research or market data or asking customers, and then use that data as the foundation to make decisions on your business or technology. But if you just assume that you know, and you're going to go off and build something or start something because that's what you assume is needed, then often finds you're going to find out that you're uh, wasting time and money and energy and you have to be able to back that up with, with facts and data. So you just mentioned building there. What's the difference between building tech versus buying tech? Is there a different practice in each system? Well, yeah. I mean, if you're buying the technology, say, off the shelf, then in theory, you can get there faster. And, and, and typically, it's cheaper. If you decide mm -hmm. to build something yourself, typically, there's a lot of expenses involved 
hardware and software and maintenance. And after a period of time, you're going to find out that you've spent more money and time trying to build something yourself than trying to buy tools or or services online that can help you do it. And what's the best way that, you know, your fans and people around you can kind of get a hold of you or get to know you better? They can reach out to me at chrishood.com and all of my social media profiles and everything is right there. Okay, nice. Well, this has been, you know, an excellent interview. And, you know, we're just going to kind of show off the website right there. Anything you want to push out here that's notable, any products, anything? Just come and join me, find me, connect with me. Happy to have you. All right, great. So um, are there any kind of concluding words you'd like to kind of throw out there to the audience? Be curious. Yeah, there we go. Be curious. Okay. Be curious. Nice. All right. So just to kind of finish this off here, people, I'm just going to give you a few shout outs. First of all, um, Judy Ryan, she's my affiliate partner. We're working together with LifeWork Systems. And essentially, she's an HR superstar, and she works within big corporate businesses to help improve and grow their infrastructure. So again, if you want to reach out to her, call me, let me know, and I could give you a connection with her. Next thing is our YouTube channel. Subscribe now so you can get good updates on what we're doing. And then also, we have a Roku channel as well. Check us out there. This will be on Roku TV as well as all of our other episodes too. And the last shout out here, the Jimbo Paris Show. If you need me to create any type of marketing system, any type of marketing strategy, I am here for you. And how do I know this? I've worked with some of the biggest corporate businesses in the world, GE, for example. I'm helping them build a marketing strategy and system. So if you want my skill set, I can give that to you. Reach out to me down here below. All right. Good talk. I'm Jimbo Paris. This is the Jimbo Paris Show. Thank you for listening to the Jimbo Paris Show. 